Okay, so Andrew, as I look back on my research into who you are and what you've done, I came across this quote that I think kind of defines the ground that you stand on. And it's a question from you. Are you participating fully in life or are you challenged by barriers? I suspect you have some answers to that question and some suggestions as to uh, how barriers can be uh, evaded. And maybe what we do is we start back in 1986. Well, of course, 1986 was the, um, the year that I was drinking and driving and crashed my motorcycle into a palm tree. But I think, um, you know, that was just one significant event in my life. Um, I think you have to go back um, to my childhood. You know, I come from a broken uh, family, parents divorced at age nine. Um, and it wasn't until recently that I came to understand how uh, that, um, that period of my life uh, affected me as a human being, um, both, um, you know, emotionally, mentally, and eventually uh, how it led to my behaviors um, that, that resulted in a motorcycle accident. But, uh, you know, my drinking started when I was much younger um, and it, it pretty much escalated uh, to a period when I was uh, 20 um, when I crashed my motorcycle and hit a palm tree. Uh, but it was really um, kind of a tough period following that accident that um, I went through because, you know, I mean, I spent three months in, in uh, rehabilitation in Northridge um, in Southern California. And back then, three months was kind of the standard. Um, you know, I, I always had a, a personality that I think was what I heard people tell me is infectious. People tend to, to um, you know, laugh at my silly jokes and and um, and and they they like me and they want to help me maybe because they they were intuitive enough to know that I've come from a, a rough background and so they they were more in, inclined to want to help me but uh, my doctors at the point at that point um, you know thought I w they'd be seeing me again because I was joking uh, they thought I'd be back so they had concerns but when I left the hospital uh, you know I, I promised them they'll never see me again unless it's for a regular checkup. Thankfully, that never that that happened, and I didn't ever have to go back. Um, but I went through this period for several years of just um, kind of being lost, uh, going back to partying, uh, trying to rebuild my self confidence. I didn't want to hang out with anybody I had known previously or grew, grown up with, with the exception of a couple of my closest friends. Um, so it was a really difficult time. I put on a bunch of weight and and. Uh, and, and, you know, I was kind of in this limbo uh, for several years uh, following my accident. But comes 1990, and it's now four years later, and there's a place in California called Big Bear, and you found your way there. Um, tell us what happened then. Well, yeah, uh, there's a, uh, a very... A well-known uh, adaptive sports program located in, in uh, Big Bear uh, in the mountains, and uh, they offered snow skiing. And I, I saw an article on it, and I, you know, I said, "What the heck?" I used to ski before my accident. I was very active. I mean, I, I surfed, I played tennis, I golfed, I you know, pretty much did everything um, a, a guy might uh, do uh, from Southern California, and uh, and that's one of the things that I lost. Um, uh, after my accident. So I found this skiing and I went up there and, and it was like an enlightenment, uh, sh you know, shown down upon me where I, uh, I was so free. I mean, I'm out there I'm skiing, even though it was this big old tank thing while they were training me, uh, I was able to, you know, scoot around the mountain and feel the exhilaration, the wind in my face and falling and the challenge of, 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 of success. You know, I knew, you know, I was frustrated, I was yelling, I was cussing, but I knew that um, I've seen other people, uh, you know, flying by me in their skis. So 
it was not only good from an emotional uh, uh, standpoint uh, to get back in, in to something that that um, that I knew was part of my DNA, but I was also able to meet people, people who were like me, who had done a lot of things in life, uh, and so many of those people and from those early days are still my closest friends today, uh, and it really changed my perception of what was possible for uh, a guy uh, who lives now using a wheelchair for mobility. You use the word possible. Um, I've heard that from other people, um, specifically from Judy Human in her book. She talks about how accessibility opens the door to possibilities. And the accessibility of adaptive skiing uh, that you found and later took on to uh, water skiing and you know you became kind of uh, a poster boy for, for uh, um, adaptive sports endeavors, uh, however you found them. And in 1996, you probably, I, I suspect you hit a turning point and you moved into the public eye. You did a, a you were on, you were a cover boy or something on Planet X, wasn't that uh, something you did? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, well, let me just say from 1990 to 1996, the trajectory was quite steep. The evolution of my uh, understanding and life in a wheelchair. And it was very incremental. So from that first time trying sports, um, I happened to meet a guy um, uh, around that time um, whose name was uh, is Bob Yant. Uh, he's a quadriplegic and at the time um, uh, his family owned a medical supply company. So uh, it was my first real job back after um, my accident and uh, I began selling medical supplies. Been hawking these supplies to people, uh, newly injured folks in, in, uh, in rehabilitation hospitals. So here I am, uh, I'm, I'm getting more involved in sports I'm learning more about the equipment. Uh, I had a, an old rickety chair, a folding chair when I got out of the hospital and I was introduced uh, uh, by uh, the previous owner of, of Colors uh, wheelchair to um, a manual wheelchair. And these things just changed my life and my ability to uh, integrate better into society. So here I am, I'm doing these sports. Um, I'm out there talking uh, at, to, to, to newly injured patients. I'm telling them things that I haven't yet even done. And so I, I'm living through these newly injured patients and really inspiring them um, while um, inspiring myself to meet those expectations. So over this uh, really six year period, I'm not only out there, I became uh, you know, a speaker on sexuality and self-esteem, and and uh, and and then in 1996, um, several things happened. Um, I w became the director of the adaptive sports program at Casa Colina Centers for Rehabilitation, um, and I was invited to produce a couple shows uh, on what was a 24-hour news station, and so it was through that. Um, those shows on, um, you know, accessible parking and sports that uh, producer from this uh, sports lifestyle show, Planet X came out. So I, I was able to get on the, the sports, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, I was one of the hosts, one of the crazy hosts, just kind of, hey, it's Andy, here I am, you know, with a bunch of hot chicks, we're at the beach. Uh, and, and it really kind of helped get out the message uh, because it was adaptive sports integrated with all these other sports that were taking place. Um, and it normalized, uh, it normalized adaptive sports at that time. So there was a lot of things that kind of came together at once as a result of my, um, you know, the, the people who surrounded uh, me and uh, I think what they saw in me, um, I certainly wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for all those folks who who 
you know, wrote the, art, the first article on me in the Orange County Register that led to all these other things. So uh, it was really a, a, a cool period of my life. Well, the interesting thing is, I mean, you talked before about possibilities, and now you're talking about purpose. Uh, how'd you wind up in Kosovo? Again, as director of one of the, the, the largest competitive adaptive sports programs in the country at the time, uh, I, we would get calls all the time from folks about programs that were taking place. And um, it was just through a phone call. Somebody said, hey, I'm, I'm putting together a, a trip um, to the first trip was in 96 to Bosnia and um, we're looking for some sports equipment or some wheelchair equipment, you know, adaptive equipment. Uh, so I was able to put together a, a bunch of equipment uh, from donations. We had a, a, a bunch of stuff in our, in our storage, um, got some things donated, put together a truck and went there as part of this, this mission. And it was at that point, again, where I met uh, some NGOs and some other organizations uh, that were, were working to improve the quality of, li uh, quality of life of those um, that were either injured as a result of the conflict uh, or had uh, disabilities for other reasons. And, um, and so I met a couple people and talked about a couple concepts. And then a year later, um, I returned with a group of, um, of seven uh, gold medal winning uh, athletes and we helped uh, establish the adaptive uh, wheelchair uh, sport basketball team uh, in Bosnia at the time. Uh, we did a tour. Uh, it, was, it was like something out of a movie. Our team traveled um, from uh, region to region and they had a, a quasi-national team that traveled along with us. They, they aired um, our game, our final game in Tuzla uh, on live TV and our team played against their national team and they beat us. It was an incredible moment uh, and it was an incredible moment for the people with disabilities um, in Bosnia at the time. And then that led to um, me returning to uh, Kosovo through some other um, relationships I had in, two, in 19, um, 90, uh, I went in 1997 and then I went back in 1999 and spent six months there developing some programs. So it was uh, 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 an incredible opportunity again to share some of my experiences, to learn about what's happening globally uh, about, you know, with people with disabilities as a result of these conflicts and um, to maybe leave a little bit of a a legacy there uh, for people that came behind those individuals um, who we were there to help. So you started assuming a kind of a public life, which is interesting, uh, considering how it got started and, you know, uh, uh, in 2001, didn't you have something to do with the back to Kosovo with the Viet Vets? In 2001, I went to Kosovo with Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation. The primary objective of the program at the time was to help uh, uh, build the infrastructure for sports and recreation for individuals with disabilities. But you know, can you you can imagine in an environment like that, uh, post conflict where you've got uh, enclaves of, of um, you know, Serbian uh, uh, folks and you know, all of this disdain that still exists. And here, uh, our primary objective through sports and recreation was really to build advocacy and to, to bring people together around sports and recreation. So we were able to uh, help multiple organizations, multiple different disability uh, organizations. We were able to help them um, uh, by providing them equipment and infrastructure to, um, you know, advocate not only uh, for the the benefits of the individuals um, who they respectively served, but we got them advocating um, with their municipalities. Uh, you know, how can we make the sports venues accessible? Uh, so it was a really uh, incredible experience and the people uh, there have an incredible fortitude to succeed and, and thrive and it was a great time. 
So your public life continues. Uh, and in, there's another man that's going to get involved in your life. And it's George Bush, the president. Talk about that. Again, here, I, I mean, I'm just a, uh, you know, a, a green, uh, you know, wet noodle really coming in. I, I, I'm just a guy who kind of things kind of just happen for me, you know, and I, you know, I'm going to take some credit for the work that I've done, but, um, you know, I really am not an expert at anything. And, and uh, I think through my work, abroad and others um, in, in early 2000, uh, I think two, I was contacted by, um, by, you know, the appointments office at the White House. And of course, you know, the president doesn't know anything about Andy Houghton. Um, and it, and uh, they said, hey, I've got this um, opportunity for you. Uh, it's a federal agency called uh, the Javits, Wag Javits Wagner O'Day Act. It's um, at the time that's what it was called, and it's a federal agency that employs uh, 50,000 people with disabilities uh, through the federal procurement program. And I said, well, I don't know, sounds good. Um, and uh, so I went through the process, and, um, and I, I was appointed in 2003 uh, to, this, to this committee. And I re I'll never forget when I got there, the, the only thing uh, that the the staff there in D.C. had was this article on me where, uh, you know, it was kind of the dude with the long hair. It was the one in the Orange County Register where I was uh, self-proclaimed whatever. Um, and so they're like, who the heck is this surfer dude coming from Southern California? Um, but as it turned out, uh, this was a very uh, amazing, uh, really almost 10 year period of my life where uh, I learned a lot about the challenges that people with the most significant disabilities face in achieving competitive integrated employment. Um, this is a three billion dollar uh, program uh, that employs a lot of people. It's very controversial because um, some individuals uh, you know, there's a, there's a group who claim that people with disabilities working under this federal uh, mandate uh, are earning less than minimum wage and are segregated uh, in, 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 in segregated seg uh, um, settings. Um, so there was a lot of stuff going on. I mean, I was going to Congress. Uh, you know, we were meeting with congressmen. We were, of course, part of the administration. But somehow, um, you know, a few years in 2006, I became the first uh, chairman of this 15-person committee, uh, the first chairman that had a dis physical disability and the first private citizen. It's made up of, of, uh, of uh, executive level uh, officers from um, the Navy, Army, military, uh, VA, uh, Social Security, and, and other key branches of government. And our responsibility was to administer this $3 billion uh, program and provide oversight to ensure the integrity of the program. So um, I became the, the first uh, chairman, uh, which essentially is the head of the federal agency. And then uh, several years later, I was um, voted again uh, in as the chairperson and it was a, a really incredible uh, opportunity to make a significant impact on a lot of people's lives. Like what? It's a very complex program that was created in 1938. So, um, you know, our, one of my biggest areas of focus was the quality of the work-life environment and the wages of the individuals with significant disabilities working in these programs. So we worked hard to implement um, a quality of work life program that put accountability on the nonprofit organizations who were administering this program, as well as the, the two uh, central nonprofit organizations who were responsible for uh, administering the program to their respective nonprofit organizations. So with, with that program, we were able to 
um, analyze and measure the increase in, in wages, the increase in placements outside of the program into competitive integrated employment. And, um, and so that's one of the things that I'm extremely proud of uh, that we worked on. There's a lot of stuff that we did that I would just bore you to death if, if I shared them with you it would require an entirely new segment. But I think just the fact that um, you had a guy with a disability uh, there who had a passion uh, to do the right thing um, was, um, was in and itself, uh, I think, in, in motivating uh, to others um, to want to kind of come around and, and do the right thing. So productivity uh, out of that assignment, you know, led to a whole level of cultural uh, repositioning and, and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of progress produced uh, opening up accessibility to the people that you were trying to bring something good to. I was like the cog in the wheel. Yeah, Go but ahead. yeah, but uh, you know, I mean, without without the cog, where's the wheel? Uh, you know, we've talked before, and uh, one of the times I commented that you were you, next to me, next to you at your desk, was a uh, was a flag, an American flag that was uh, encased in a uh, tribute box. Um, How'd that get there? So, you know, in the federal government, I guess when you, you know, serve for a period of time and, um, and you move on to the next thing, uh, you know, there, there was uh, some recognition for the work that I had done. And one of the things that, that were, was, was given to me uh, when I left there was a flag that was uh, flown over uh, the Pentagon. Uh, and there was also a flag flown over the Capitol that was given to me. I mean, who gets, who, who gets that stuff? It's just, um, you know, when I look at these things, I just think of how fortunate I was to have these momenta, mementos of, you know, a period of my life that I would have never dictated um, or imagined. And, and um, I was just a guy who hit a palm tree. And here I am, you know, I was walking the halls of the Capitol, I was at the White House, um, and these are just recognitions of, of the people I was there uh, to serve. And that's the people with the most significant disabilities. Uh, who often face the most challenges in life. You know, it's, uh, it's a consistent story uh, for me as I do these interviews. Uh, the people that, that we have these interviews with are, who are people like yourself. They're all over the place in the, in the quote, business. Uh, they're people of passion, you know, and how they got there, you know, whether it was fortunate or unfortunate or their demise or somebody else's, it, it almost doesn't matter because, you know, so many people enter uh, their lives, their, their campaign for the, and their journey for their lives motivated by other things. The people that are motivated in this business are motivated to create accessibility, to create possibilities, to bring purpose both to themselves and then share it mutually across transcending periods of time, uh, you know, and uh, it's, it's kind of an amazing phenomenon. This is a very, very unusual uh, business to be affiliated with uh, because there's so much active participation in not just self, but others. Uh, you know, you really don't feel like you've done anything in this business until you've done it for others. Um, and, and so you moved on from, from that background into some personal goals that have brought you into 
sharing your experience, your strength, your hope uh, for development, you know, in business and consulting and, and, and talk a little bit about where you are today. Well, let me just um, take a, a moment first. I, you know, I, I have to say that, um, you know, I was the only guy there. I was uh, well serving in that commission. Really, in most things I do uh, in life, I'm the least educated. Um, and, you know, back then, the least experienced. Um, and, you know, probably the least knowledgeable about the subject matter at that time, at least. But yet, uh, somehow, um, you know, there's, there's something there that enabled me to want to learn as much as I can um, so, I could own, so I could kind of rise up to that level uh, of folks. I mean, I'm serving next to rear admirals and, um, you know, highly educated uh, folks who've been in leadership roles for a long time. And, and I have to tell you that, that that insecurity stayed with me um, the entire time that I was there. And, and it was really a difficult time for me when I left um, that commission in 2011 uh, and came home um, uh, to, you know, kind of my, my life in, in Florida. Um, now being there uh, as, as on that commission, I traveled all over the country, over 100,000 miles a year uh, often. So uh, here I go from this position of leadership uh, surrounding with you know major responsibilities and it wasn't a full-time thing it was a, a part-time thing uh, but uh, it was something that consumed I had allowed to consume my time because I felt like um, I could make a difference um, but when I came home uh, all that was gone and um, I had a real sense of, of, of vacancy in in my life and uh, and it, it, it led to uh, a series of, of kind of um, health, mental health, um, uh, you know, awareness of some of my issues related to mental health uh, and, um, you know, substance abuse. But on a, you know, on a positive note, I was able to kind of take all of this experience that I had uh, and I had always had a, my business to produce uh, videos, training videos, uh, educational videos. So I formed, I formed a company uh, in 2012 um, that uh, integrated global strategies to, uh, you know, kind of formalize this production business. And, uh, you know, business was good. We were producing um, media for a lot of clients, and I still have some of those same clients today. Um, but as time passed, I started to learn more about the needs of business. And, uh, and so in 2015, uh, you know, I, I started exploring, creating some e-learning trainings. Because uh, all this training that's out there, um, you know, corporations have learning management systems, um, and there's all these different types of trainings out there. They, they have to go. Some are mandatory, uh, others aren't. But um, I wanted to come up with something that was short and sweet and that was disability centric. So I started uh, creating these modules. I had a whole bunch of them created, uh, but I couldn't find out how to make them accessible. So I partnered uh, in 2016 with Bender Consulting uh, Services, and we established a separate company and created a company called iDisability. And with that, we have 45 e-learning modules uh, that we license to global corporations, all focused on, uh, on disability, um, you know, all kinds of disability hiring, recruiting, different levels uh, from executive level to um, to customer service, et cetera. So that was um, kind of an evolution of my business. And then in 2017, uh, I realized that there was a need to, uh, there was really a push for, um, you know, creating inclusive environments built in the built environment. 
And having had experience uh, 10 years prior uh, being part of a nonprofit organization that developed the first standards uh, on universal design in the built environment, the Global Universal Design Commission, I had some background uh, in universal design in the built environment. Uh, so I teamed up with a, 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 a buddy and uh, now my partner uh, who's an architect and has an architect, uh, is a senior executive at an architect and engineering firm. And um, we started uh, creating a process for global corporations to implement universal design strategies uh, into their, um, their buildings and their, their new buildings and their renovations. And that business has really taken off uh, over the past uh, four years and is, um, is really becoming uh, very uh, prominent uh, in, in terms of uh, my focus um, at, at Integrated Global Strategies Disability Inclusion Solutions. In the last couple of years, we've had this pandemic. Has that uh, accelerated the turn to universal design? I don't know if it has had an effect, but you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm grateful that the pandem pandemic has not had an impact on any of our businesses. The e-learning, um, you know, was really kind of helped inspire folks to want to train uh, internally and and not in person. Um, but I think people are reimagining their workforce. So to some degree. Yeah, the pandemic has kind of um, progressed the, um, you know, the business approach to um, in, in including universal design in their strategies. Uh, but I think the reimagining of the workforce is really, um, you, you know, kind of been the, the center uh, motivator behind uh, behind companies looking to change the, the, the workplace experience for their global workforce. I mean, universal design isn't about people with disabilities. It's about everybody. It's about, you know, you know the entire, um, you know, population. How do we uh, create an environment that is as user-friendly and intuitive uh, as possible, and that's where universal design comes in. So, we uh, we work very closely with uh, many global corporations to implement universal design. Uh, in so far since 2017, we've worked in I think 17 countries uh, plus the United States. So it's it's really been a um, an amazing uh, kind of you know, just happened to create a. A business around demand. It actually, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, in the last industrial revolution, I mean, automated process, uh, you know, a hundred years ago was considered impossible. Everything had to be done by hand. And then, you know, uh, pioneers of their time, Henry Ford being one of them, proved that no, 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 we can, we can do this uh in a in a simpler way and be more productive and so on and so forth and here a hundred years later uh it it kind of feels what what we're looking at is a you know you you talk about reimagining the the, the workplace or the workforce uh, i think technology the underlying technology and the capabilities uh and as you know, and use, we keep using coming back to the word uh, possibilities that are presented unlock and a, a tremendous opening uh, for for uh, for businesses to to change the the playbook from a hundred years ago, uh, learn from what we've done in the past, apply what's here now. Uh, which includes, you know, assistive technologies that were unimagined a long time ago, uh, executed by an interesting workforce that is often uh, the early adopters and, you know, the best problem solvers you'll ever find. And I think one of the things that your life represents and your story represents 
is resolution over the problem of reality. Uh, you know, you've, you've come a long way. You've done a lot of interesting things. You've traveled all over the world. You've accomplished uh, anything that you set your mind to. And, and here we are uh, in 2021 as we review that and check mark, check mark, check mark, check mark, you know, mission accomplished. Um, those things don't happen uh, by accident. They happen be with purpose. And uh, had you not thought about getting out of the house and going up to Big Bear, I wonder if you ever think about what may have been. But Big Bear was there, it was accessible. Uh, I have been passed on the ski slopes by persons like you that embarrass me. <laughs> How could anybody do that? You know, yeah. but, but you can, you can. So it's a mixture of human spirit. It's a mixture of faith in self. Uh, and it's a mixture of a lot of things that people contribute to you. And now you're given back, you've given back, you know, as much as you've taken. Uh, so, you know, I congratulate you uh, on, a, on a life well spent. Um, I have a feeling we could talk for another three hours, but uh, we really do need to move along. But anybody that viewed this today or views it in the future now has a much, much better understanding about how accessibility matters and why it matters and how you make it matter. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, John. It's been a pleasure.